Culture isn't the foosball table in the break room. It's not Hawaiian shirt Friday. It's not any of the things you can usually see. It's what those things point to that makes the difference between a high performance team culture and a really confusing one. Hey leader, David Burke is here, organizational psychologist and author of four best-selling books on helping leaders and teams do their best work ever, including helping the culture of a team turn into the best one ever. Because culture is a big factor in the success or failure of a team. There are cultures where individual talent and the focus on just the needs of any one individual or star player turn into this level of toxicity that actually derails everyone. And then there are cultures that believe that that the needs of the team are greater than the needs of the talent, that the team is greater than the talent. But culture's often confusing. Culture's often misunderstood. A lot of times we look at whole companies and teams that have great culture and we look at what we can see. We look at what we can see. That's fairly obvious. What I mean is that we only really think that culture is those things we can see, those things we can hear, the surface level elements of culture. But that's quite simply not true. Going all the way back to researcher Edgar Schein, one of the foremost and probably like the grandfather of the study of organizational culture, we've known that there are surface level artifacts and then there are all sorts of espoused beliefs and values underneath. It's unfortunately, to beat a dead cliche, it's a bit like an iceberg. There are the things you can see at the top, but then there's a whole lot more underneath that. And what we're gonna do in this episode is we're gonna talk about all the layers of the iceberg. We're gonna start at what matters, and then we'll move up to the things you can see because that's the way you have to start. If you just focus on the things you can see, you'll find yourself by getting a foosball table and then wondering why that didn't just magically make all the toxicity on your team disappear. You gotta start with what's below the surface and then intelligently choose everything else in order to intelligently build the best culture ever. So at the bottom level of the pyramid, the lowest level on the iceberg, whatever metaphor you wanna use, we have values. What are the things your team actually values? What are the non-negotiables? And, and this can be anything. This can be the impact that your team is making and the values they have there. This could be their commitments to each other. This could be how much they value honesty. Every team's going to be a little bit different, but everyone's going to have a different level of values, the levels, the things that they put importance on. One of the things we see in the research on teams is that sometimes certain values get elevated to the level of what we might even call sacred values. Okay, in companies we often call them core values, but when we look at tribes and other cultures, they're seen as sacred values, things worth defending. And I think that's a great question to ask when you look at yeah, all of the value statements. I mean, you can Google lists and lists of value statements and things you know you should throw a dart at and pick five and those are your company core values. You don't wanna run that way. You wanna look at that list and you wanna go, what's worth fighting for? What's worth defending? Those things that our, t our team finds so important that we would put 100% of our effort into protecting. Those are your sacred values. Those are the ones that lay the foundation for everything else we're gonna talk about. And if you haven't had a conversation on your team about what those are, well then it's not really worth going any further. I mean it is, please watch the rest of this video. But what I mean is start there and it may take you a couple weeks to lay out the values before you can move any further up the pyramid. The next level on the pyramid is beliefs. And okay, values, but then beliefs, what's the difference? Remember, values are things we're willing to defend at all costs. Beliefs are about the way we see the world. Right? Do we see that the rest of the world has the same values as us? Do we see that the rest of the world is making progress? Some teams believe that their role in uh, society or in their organization is turning around an injustice. And other teams believe that very thing is actually progress, right? So different teams have different beliefs. You especially see this if you go from one company to a competitive company. Beliefs are about the value of the different brands change. And so you want to get very clear about what your team believes, what your team believes about effective teamwork, what your team believes about the tasks it's assigned to do, and what your team believes about the meaning behind those tasks, the contributions or the impact that those tasks will have. 
And yeah, that's going to flow from your values. Those things that are worth defending are obviously going to shape your idea of how you make a contribution because hopefully you do it in a way that's true to your values. So you have to start with values, but then you can graduate up to beliefs. If it's up for debate across society or across your organization or your industry, settle the debate on your team and say, these things we believe. Once you settle on values and beliefs, now we can move up in the pyramid. Now we can move maybe above the surface. Now we can do the things that are fun. And here, there are really three ways that teams reiterate their beliefs and values in ways other teams can see, but especially in ways that, that reinforce them through action. The first level is rituals. Rituals are the behaviors, the norms. It can be everything from a handshake to the use of acronyms or jargon. It can be inside jokes. We use rituals on a team and in a team culture in two ways. The first is that rituals signal belonging. In fact, all of the three we're going to talk about signal belonging. They signal, if you understand what this ritual means, it's because you're a member of the team. You're an insider. But more importantly, often those rituals can be ways that we reinforce beliefs or reinforce meaning. So some teams I've worked with, you know, they, they do things like they keep an empty chair in every meeting room to remind themselves of the client or the stakeholder that they're being served. Others observe a ritual like a moment of reverence or a moment of a reminder about why we're doing things before we go execute on that idea. Other teams will do rituals to get themselves energized and excited before they start a shift or before they start their work week. And even other teams will do fun rituals that just keep them bonded together. Rituals flow out of your values and beliefs, but they turn very quickly into actions, into actions, things that are done, things that are spoken, and things that you understand because you belong. Next level up from rituals and really kind of a form of a ritual are rallying cries. What is the slogan? What is the phrase that your team could begin to adopt that speaks to the meaning and impact that it has, to speak to the importance of the work that it does? You know, I jokingly, when I work in speeches and when I work with clients, I jokingly say one of my favorite rallying cries is if you think about the TV show The Mandalorian from the Star Wars universe, you have this canon of beliefs that the Mandalorians believe leave. And whenever one of them is tested, they go into this ritual where they begin to ask each other questions. And the ritual ends with the rallying cry. This is the way. You might not use this as a way. I mean, you could steal it if you want to, but you might have another one. You know, I've worked with legal teams who've decided that their rallying cry is hold the line because what do you do in legal, right? You make sure that everything is in bounds and that the organization, even people who aren't on your team, are protected. I work with sales teams who will use phrases like we make it rain as their rallying cry because they're the ones that are creating inbound revenue. Whatever it is that your team values and believes and its function in the larger organization or in society, I bet there's a one sentence slogan you can use and reuse to the point where it becomes a rallying cry for your team and a ritual in its own right. And the last level, the top, maybe the most obvious element of a team culture are symbols. Yeah, the foosball table that we talked about earlier, that's a symbol, right? The perks that uh, an organization offers, those are symbols. They symbolize something else. And that's why if you just copy one from another team or from another organization without doing all of the work of having that symbol be developed out of your values and beliefs and your rituals and your rallying cries, that's why it never really works. It doesn't work to transplant a symbol from one team to another. It has to grow out of who that team is. And symbols come in a variety of forms. Symbols can be a visual image, an icon. Think about like the four houses in Harry Potter and then the animals, the mascots, the symbols that come out of all of that, right? They identify certain characteristics of those four different houses. Really weird millennial references here going on, right? Mandalorian, Harry Potter, stay with me. Symbols can also be deeper and more meaningful. A number of years ago, I spoke at the US Naval Academy. And after my lecture, I was presented with a coin from the US Naval Academy. I eventually learned about the tradition of challenge coins in the US military. Every coin, a symbol of a mission completed, or a team, or an operation, or a leader, Every coin is a symbol. I've seen other teams use you know, repetitive symbols like wooden nickels that they give to each other to signal a good job. So you as a team get to decide what that symbol is, but it's a visual and sometimes a tangible object that points back to the rallying cry. The rallying cry itself being a ritual. Maybe the giving, bestowing of the symbol becomes a ritual. All of it flows from your beliefs and your values. And we've already covered it, right? Why it's so obvious that you can't just transplant the surface level elements of a team culture. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the work clarifying values and beliefs. But if you do that hard work, the fun work 
begins. The work of building rituals, or maybe just discovering existing inside jokes that can serve as rituals. The work of drafting rallying cries. The work of creating symbols that reinforce that culture. And in doing so, make people feel more connection to each other and more motivation to do that work. Team culture is reiterated through symbols and rallying cries and rituals, but it stems from values and beliefs. And the values and beliefs are what make the difference between a so-so culture and a culture of a team that can do their best work ever. Oh, and one more thing. If you're really at a loss for values and beliefs, there are certain values and beliefs that are universal to almost all positive team cultures. If you're wondering what they are, you're gonna to wanna to check out this video here on what makes for a great team culture.